I'm gonna start, I'll start by saying I love symbolic regression. I think it's so cool. Because it gives you, you can give me like any basic data. And I can try to fit it with a function. Where I can tell you, given this function, and you tell me the independent variables, I can tell you the dependent variable. All right, I wanted to double check. I forgot to double check. Let me have a look where I mixed and messed up. All right, the dependent variable is plotted along the y. Yes, okay. The independent is along, okay, that was correct. Good. So, yeah, I, uh, I just love the fact that it gives me the ability to come up with some rather complex functions that are really great at like fitting the data. And it's wonderful. Do I have the example of in here? Oh, shoot, I do not. Hmm. Hmm. Try to remind me, when we finish this topic, if we finish it today, try to remind me to show you the, uh, a fancy example of it, all right? Try to re remind, remind me of that. I'll try to remember, too. But yeah, I love symbolic regression. And what's cool about symbolic regression, too, and about like genetic programming in general, is it, unlike a lot of other forms of like AI, machine learning, and optimization, you don't get a black box in the end. You get something you can look at with genetic programming. When I fit the data, I get a function I can look at and I can understand. I could fit this data with a neural network and say, given this input, predict what the output's going to be. That's all the function is doing, right? But if I do it with a neural network, you can't open it up after. You can't look inside and go, I know what's happening. There are going to be people like, no, you totally can't. All you have to do is jump through a thousand and one hoops, and then you still don't actually know what's going on inside. People will say that, but you really don't. Not like this. With symbolic regression, you get a nice, beautiful, clean function at the end that you can look at. And what's valuable there is it gives you a chance to, <coughs> it gives you an opportunity to understand why the function made that prediction. Oh, it's the sum, it's the, it's the square difference of these two independent variables that's really important, that's really interesting. So there's something about that phenomenon that matters. You can learn more about the system you're learning when you've got this like transparent box in the end that you can understand, it's fantastic. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, is there any way you could like, so with like support factor machines and machine learning, one of the big issues is like finding a good kernel. Like, could you like use this to like try to find like, a Absolutely you could. Absolutely you could. The only problem you'd have there is you'd need to be really worried about overfitting your kernel for a specific data set. Yeah. But if you're doing it with the correct care, yeah, you'll absolutely find a phenomenal kernel for for your support vector machines, yeah. The, the other thing I was wondering, how, like, I, I'm sure, like, you could just extend it to, like, three dimensions or four dimensions. Uh, yeah. But, like, how much longer would that take to, like, actually converge to, like, a nice answer? Like, would that make it take, like, way longer? Well, it'll, the more dimensions you have, the, the bigger the search space becomes. Yeah. But with, with deep, it, it it's hard to give you a straight answer. It, it is going to take longer. Um, every time you add a new, new dimension, it's not like making it like n squared more. It, it's not like it's, it's like that. It's all dependent on all of the different things. So yes, it will take longer, but maybe not as bad as you think. Now, like when I was doing some of this stuff during my PhD, and I had like 30 dimensions or 60 dimensions, um, I was letting my algorithm run for like a week trying to fit that data. But it wasn't, but the data was, I was trying to fit was complex, uh, nonlinear time series data that I let run that long. I didn't need to let it run that long. If I let it run for only like 
an hour, I'd probably get pretty good results still, but I really want, I wanted really, 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 really good results. And there were a lot of things I did that it en enabled it to be run that, like the, the genetic programming system I was using that I wrote for this was designed in such a way to prevent like early convergence. It was designed to speed up fitness evaluation. It was designed, there was a lot of really fancy shit in there to keep it so it could run that long and still get good answers. Um, but as a quick answer to your question, yeah, more dimensions will make it take longer, but it's not going to like go crazy. On the assignment, there's some problems I give you that are like two dimensions. Uh, some are like five, dim I think I go up to like four or five dimensions, and you'll get a sense for how long they take, and you, you probably won't notice like catastrophic differences in run times. The differences in run times are going to come down to all of the other things you need to do, right? Like maybe if there are five dimensions, you want to make the trees a little bigger because you want them to be able to be included. So that will make it take longer. And maybe because of that, because the trees are bigger, I'm going to have to make the population size a little bigger and maybe the number of generations a little bigger. So there's a lot at, that's gone, but yeah. All right, so deep. Unlike a basic, regular old GA, Deep is, or sorry, genetic programming, there's a little bit of stuff going on, right? It's not trivial. So often people won't go and implement their basic um, genetic programming from scratch. They're going to go use an existing system and interface with that system to do genetic programming, which is what I'm going to tell you to do for assignment two. So it's what I strongly suggest you do for assignment two. I'm not going to stop anyone that's going to say, no, I want to write my own. By all means, go for it. Go for it. It's really not that bad. I'm not saying, oh, it's so hard, therefore use deep. I'm just saying, typically people today are just going to go straight to deep. But if you want to implement it on your own, by all means, it won't take you that long or anything. It's just, you know. Um, there are a lot of genetic programming systems out there. Uh, they do a lot of the heavy lifting for you. They take care of like the representation and the genetic operators and what happens if it's typed versus untyped. Like it's taking care of a lot of that work for you, which is really good. Um, there's a lot of evolutionary algorithm frameworks out there in various programming languages. A popular one in Python is Deep. It's called Distributed Evolutionary Algorithms in Python. The distributed, if you ask me, is a bit of a it's, it's a bit of a lie in my opinion, but whatever. I could be wrong, but I think they're lying when they call it distributed. But it's, it's a package that you can get. You can type pip install deep, you're going to get it. It's there. It's on PyPy. If you download the course repo, like if you cloned it and you create the virtual environment, deep comes in the virtual environment. Python will download it for you automatically if you set that up correctly. It's not for genetic programming. It's got a lot of evolutionary algorithm stuff built into it, including PSO. Like the third assignment is going to be particle swarm optimization. Now, for PSO, I don't recommend using Deep's PSO. I re recommend using the basic implementation I give you because PSO is hilariously simple. Um, so there's no, it's probably more work than it's worth to try to figure out how to use Deep's than it is to just implement it. Um, any genetic program. Although any genetic program, programming system typo could be used, deep will be used here. You can go to their GitHub page. You know, it exists. Yeah, you can read all about it. For assignment, every year students come to office hours going like, I don't get deep. I don't understand it all. And I say, Do you read, did you read the documentation? And I'll get one of two answers, and both, both are a problem. One is going to be like, no. Then I go, go read the documentation. It's like you get a new product, and you're like, why don't I understand how to use it immediately? Obviously. Go read the documentation. And the other answer I get is, yeah. And then I go, no, you didn't. <laughs> They're lying. Or I show it to them and they mean like, oh, I didn't know I was supposed to read all of the documentation. Well, no, I don't mean go read the full API list and every possible function that exists. There's a set of like tutorials and a getting started thing. Yeah. Really? Oh, I wonder if they're having an issue. Deep. Let's, I want to check it out. Maybe. 
It could have been a you problem. It could have been a time of day problem. It could have been, let's see what happens. It could have been. Also, the Wi Fi was dead. Yeah, if you were doing it yesterday on. Oh, all right. So it looks fine. It could have been. It could have been anything. I don't know where they're hosting this. Maybe their host was having an issue. Maybe it was. Maybe it really was a U issue. Right now, it's looking pretty snappy. Uh, that's not to say it's always snappy, of course. Hopefully, when you go read the documentation, um, you will be satisfied, and it'll be nice and quick and snappy. The documentation's really good. Like when people come up, they're like, but how am I supposed to know how to do typed DGP? And I go like, well, did you read the documentation? And they'll say yes. And I'm like, OK, click it and do Control F and typed typed. And it's like, here's how you do type GP. And you're like, are you effing kidding me? <laughs> read the goddamn documentation. So just read the docs. If you go here, look at this. It's not even a big page. Half of it's giant pictures. Right? It shows you an example. It also has a guided tutorial on how to perform symbolic regression. It even, it even shows you how to do symbolic regression. Look at it. It's not even big. And there's more advanced tutorials you could find for anything you want to do. Right? Here's a, a series of uh, different scripts, all doing genetic programming with Deep. Have at it. Right? There's a lot of examples available to you. Consult the documentation. It's lovely. And what's great about it too is you get feel you can feel real special because the documentation was made by like a couple of a couple of people that were just working on the project, right? Like Deep isn't made by a big organization. It was made by some guy. It started by like some guy at Laval. So there's gonna be like typos or little issues here and there. And if you're going through the documentation and you find an issue, submit a pull request to update the text of the documentation. They will be very happy. They'll get really excited like, ooh, someone submitted a pull request. And they'll be like, great, they improved it, yay. Right, so it's not just me that we get excited about you submitting pull requests. Like this is a real deal, this is deep. People use deep. I've submitted pull requests for deep, it's great. All right, data. So, the data being used typically when doing symbolic regression is like tabular data. It's, it's like represented as a table of rows and columns, right? Rows will be various observations. Columns will be the different variables, all right? Really, sh this should be x1, not b whatever. So here's some example data. This is three-dimensional data. The format of the data I give you for the assignment is always every column is a different independent variable until you get to the last. And the last column is always the dependent variable. The dependent variable is the fancy word we use to mean I want a function that takes these two values that tells me this value. OK? That's what I mean. The last one is what I want a function of all of these to give me that. So if I had a function and I said, OK, function of negative 3.16833349, or I guess 31, and then another one here of, uh, if I have a function and for the two arguments the function wants, I give it this number and this number, the function should give me this number. And if I give it, then if I give that same function, this number and this number, I want that number. Uh-oh, my battery. Did I not plug it in? Oh, my goodness. Wow, it does not take long for the battery to die on this thing. Holy moly. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Oh, my goodness. That was close. All right. So do you get it? I want a function that takes this and this and gives me this. So it's three-dimensional. The function takes two arguments, OK? But it is three-dimensional data. Cool? 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 All right. This data was generated by some phenomenon. I'll tell you how I made it. I went into Python. I made a function of just some arbitrary, just some arbitrary like arithmetic function, like x1 squared minus x2 to the power of 3 divided by 17.5. 
and your jaw, and then I take the output. That's what I did. That's how I generated all this data, right? So I use some function to generate this data, but I do not, I'm not telling you what it is. And for the fun of it, what's up? Well, there's definitely going to be maybe a little bit of trig in there. And, you know, you will have to do a little bit of digging. You might have to play around a little bit. They're not going to be wild or wacky, but, you know. <coughs> to make it a little bit more tricky for you, I also, when I generated the numbers, when I generated that output, this isn't the output of the function. No, 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 no. What I did is I took the output of the function and added a little bit of random noise to it, too. I added some little bullshit epsilon value to each output just to, just to screw with you, right? To make it a little harder. Because in reality, any observation you make is never going to be perfect. There's noise in all the data. So I added noise to the data because screw you, that's why, right? Have fun with it. <laughs> so your job is, in spite of not knowing what the function is, and in spite of me adding noise, your job is to say, your job is to find that function, right? So we're playing a game. The game is, I, I wrote a function. I'm not telling you what it is, but here's the data. Can you tell me what function it is? Now, if you were to go back 100 years ago, if you were to go back 200 years ago and go talk to an important scientist at the time and say, I've got a magic box that will Given some observations, it'll automatically tell you the function that, that generated it. They would shit their pants, okay? Because that's what science was then, right? They were going like, oh my god, we need to magically and meticulously look at the data, find the relationships. You could, by hand, of any of those functions I give you, you could, by hand, try through trial and error to find that function. You could do it, all right? And that's what people used to do. And that happened sucks. But now we can do it like that with symbolic regression. It's mind-blowing to me. And the reason I'm emphasizing symbolic regression, yeah, regular old linear regression has been around a while. Don't get me wrong, and it's great, but it requires linear data. That's going back to this problem. You can't fit that data with linear regression. You can if you convert the data or you do linear regression of nonlinear basis functions and play all these tricks and hacks in order to make it work. You can, but you have to do a lot more work and there's a lot more guesswork and assumptions you have to make. With symbolic regression, you go, do it, and it does it. Sure, you got to tinker with some values like anything with hyperparameters, right? Maybe you have to go in and add a sign function to your language. All right, tough, right? But in general, not too bad. <clears throat> so, the data, here's some code to get the data. Just open the file, split the data, take all the independent variables out, and then have a column of the dependent variables. So with this data the way it is, the independent variable is, the independent variables will be a matrix. It might be a vector if, there's only, if it's a two-dimensional problem. But it's going to be a matrix, and the dependent variable is a column. All right? So with the example up here, the, dependent, the independent variable is this. It's going to be a list of length n by 2. The dependent variable is just a list of length n. OK? That's how it is. <clears throat> that's all I'm saying there. So that's like the above example. Any questions so far? This is just about loading up the data. It shouldn't be too bad. Oof. So for evaluation, for fitness, usually what we do is uh, mean squared error. That's mean squared error right there. Basically, you say, what was my observation? What am I predicting? So this is your function's output, y hat. You take the difference, you square it, you add them all up and you divide it by, so you take the average of the squared difference, differences of all of your predictions versus observations. 
I mean, did I say this last time? Does anyone know why we like mean squared error? Because the, the, it, it's, it's about like the blame game. The proportion of the ba like bad numbers here, mean squared error, zero is perfect. Numbers bigger than zero are less perfect. Bigger numbers bigger than zero are even more or less perfect, right? So when you square the error, mistakes that are bigger are blamed way more than mistakes that are smaller. So this means the algorithm will kind of focus on eliminating the big mistakes a little bit more and kind of work its way down towards getting nice and tighter around your actual data. Is that clear? At least the intuition behind mean squared error? Any metric could be used. We like mean squared error. It punishes bigger errors more. Yeah, cool. So here's the code for mean squared error. Well, let's look at the function. What do we have? We have a compiled individual. So this right here, a compiled individual, this will be like a candidate solution. <clears throat> now, a candidate solution in deep will be represented as like a tree, right? But you can't run a tree as if it's a function. So deep actually provides a, a, a function that will compile your trees into actual runnable functions. So this will be a, a candidate solution that's been compiled as if it's a function that can be run. OK? This is a function that is a candidate solution that we can call as a function. We have our independent variables and our dependent variables. Great. So what do we have? Running error squared sum. Running. Maybe it should be running squared error sum. Whatever. I'm looping over each thing. I run the function on the independent variables, get y hat. I take the difference, square it, add it to the running total. And in the end, I return that divided by the length. It's just mean squared error. At this stage, this should not be a spooky algorithm. The only thing that might be a little spooky is the fact that this is, in fact, a compiled function. Maybe you're not familiar with zip, but zip is a way to kind of like loop over two things at a time where each time through the loop, the first thing from independent variables will be in XS, and the first thing independent variable will be in Y. Okay, it's a Python thing. And this right here, does this, has anyone seen this before? Does anyone know what this is doing? It's kind of, this one is like a weird one, it's a Python y thing. All it means is this might be a list, right? And this is a function that takes multiple arguments. But it just so happens that this is a, this is a three-dimensional problem, meaning I have my dependent variables for this particular example we're talking about, like this one. For every observation, there are two independent variables, right? There's the x1 and x2, right? So the function takes two arguments. So in this example, xs is actually a list of two values. This function expects two arguments. But I'm trying to give it a list, which is one value. So what this means is un unpack it. The star means take that list and unpack it as if they're separate values. So a list. One list of two values turns into just the two values that immediately get passed to the function. That's all. It's Python fancy syntax. Let's see if I can do a quick example here. I don't, I don't know if this is actually going to work. I'm going to find out right now. Well, OK, hold on. I think this might work. Okay, yeah. So this is unpacking in general in Python. So Python's happy to do this. But it's all like context dependent. So if I have
Why is it mad? What's wrong with the Z? W, oh. There. Right? So see this function? This function takes four arguments, and then when it's run, the parameters get printed out. Yeah? I mean, you put the Z twice in that print. I did. What was wrong with me? What's going on there? There. Much better. This function should not be spooky. <laughs> right? It should be fairly simple. And I, I have a list here. So when I say ASD, ASD, and I give it A, it's going to be like, well, hold on. I'm missing three arguments. You gave me one. This function needs four. So what you can say is like, well, those arguments are in a list. So just pretend that they're not. And that'll work. That's what it does. It's a pretty neat little thing. Yeah? What if the list was like, you added a six to the end there, too? Like, would it still, like, well, what would happen? What do you think's going to happen? I'm going to guess it's just going to ignore the six, but I'm not sure. No, it's going to say, this function takes four arguments, but you gave me five. What's going on there? That's what. Like, I guess it could have gone either way because it's funny, like Python syntax. My guess is that it was going to do this because it was just going to unpack the values and give it to the function. The function's going to be like, what the hell? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> That's a good question. So, like, let's say b equals 0. Okay, well, let's get rid of that. I'm, I think this might work. Oh. So rather than the list of four things, make a list of two lists. Oh, okay, that's not, there's no way that'll work, but I'm wondering, can we make it work? And if it does work, as if I'm in double pairs, that's, that's what I want to know now. Because when I unpack A, it's just going to unpack into the two separate lists. So this is not going to work. Yeah, it's going to say, I'm missing lines. That, but what happens if I uh, double unpack? Do I have to triple unpack? No, nah, it's not a thing. Hmm. That was a fun question. <laughs> well, we discovered together that it was a nonsense question, I guess. I don't know. Long story short, don't do it that way, I guess. But you could, all you have to do is flatten that array or that list, right? So you can flatten it and then do it. And that would work if you really wanted to do it. Anyways, here's the fitness function, language. OK, with symbolic regression, genetic programming, we'll be searching a space. This the search space is going to be a search space of operators and operands. And remember, a language isn't really just a GP thing, a genetic programming thing. All evolutionary computation have to specify what values are allowable in your chromosomes, but perhaps it's a little bit more obviously clear with genetic programming that that's the case. Now, the trouble is, when you start, it's not always going to be clear on what operators and operands should be included. And to be clear, remember, this is just symbolic regression. You can use genetic programming for like classification, like we talked about the breast cancer classification problem. But we want... <clears throat> our language. We want our language to be comprehensive enough that it can actually represent all possible um, functions that we might want, but we don't want it to be too big or too inclusive because then it's going to include a bunch of things that are just going to make the search space bigger, right? So we want to constrain the search space but we want to make sure it's comprehensive enough. So again, this all comes down to the problem of our encoding and making sure it's, it's capable of representing everything we want to represent while not over-representing too much because then we just can't work with it well. Right? It's just going to waste time in making the big search space too big. With symbolic regression, an easy, common way to start is your arithmetic operators, maybe some trig functions. If I start running my code and the trig functions never pop up in the final population, maybe I get rid of them. They don't seem important. And maybe if you're feeling crazy, you might want log or Euler's number. You know, maybe they're going to be there because those pop up in nature You know, if you're modeling some natural thing. I would probably start, if I was doing it, I'd probably start with these two. 
If I'm, getting, if I'm getting decent results and I'm not noticing any trig pop up in my candidate solutions in any meaningful way, I'll get rid of those from the language. Run it a little bit. If it feels like it's missing, maybe I'll try to add a little more. You keep it simple to start. But there's a problem with divide. We've got a big problem with divide, actually. Because when you've got, excuse me, when you've got a tree, let's say we've got a simple tree like this. Divide x1 and x2, right? It's divide. But what's going to happen if x2, if the observation you have, if x2 happens to be 0? It's going to crash your program, right? That's no good. So, hmm. So, what do we do? Well, instead, I need to update this comment. This is wrong. I've changed it to math.inf. Um, is we write a protected divide. We write our own divide that says, okay, let's just pretend. Like, if we're observing natural data, what are the odds that the thing we're observing is really zero? I don't know. So what we'll do is we'll pretend, actually, I really do, could someone please submit an issue on the GitHub repo that says this function, is the, the doc string is incorrect. Someone please do that ASAP, otherwise I'll forget and it's a problem. Um, <clears throat> if it so happens that the divisor is zero, instead of crashing, now the doc string says return some arbitrarily large number, that was not what's happening here. Now it returns math.inf, infinity instead, just to be like, OK, just you know, pretend it's some huge number. Yeah? So this wouldn't account for 0 divided by 0, though, right? Yeah, it would, because the divisor is 0. Because 0 divided by 0 is still undefined, right? Yeah, but I guess, I guess I was just saying it wouldn't be infinity. But... Well, what is 0? Well, I mean, it's, anything divided by 0 isn't infinity. It's not defined. Right, but we're just saying yeah. we're just calling it infinity. Okay. Zero divided by zero is still not defined, right? Yeah, it's still not defined. Okay, yeah, okay. I was just checking to make sure I'm not forgetting something. Um, so yeah. Oh, and then at the end, yeah, most of the time it's going to work just fine. Now it's interesting if you go into the literature, if you go and look what a lot of genetic programming people do with their protected divide is instead what they'll do is if you accidentally divide by 0, you return 1. Now, in my opinion, that's really stupid because it makes no sense mathematically. That's not, I think they're doing it, I'm not sure why, I don't know, I think it's dumb, so I don't do that because that doesn't make any sense. I realize infinity is still not quite right, but I think it's a hell of a lot better. Because to me, I'm like, okay, let's pretend it's not zero. Let's pretend it's just really, 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 And if that's the case, it's going to be some huge arbitrarily large number, right? So that's why I'm throwing infinity in there. Hopefully you agree. If not, tough. So here's how we set the language. So first of all, I wrote this function protected divide with a bad doc string, apparently. And then in here, this is where, this is how we set the language in deep. In deep, we start by saying, okay, we need to create a, a primitive set. This is our language, okay? And the root of it, you know, we're going to call this main because it's whatever, it's arbitrary. Um, it's primitive set. I'm pretty sure this is because it is single typed, meaning that we didn't need to specify the return type here. Primitive means, it, it doesn't matter, it's just what they called it. Primi in general, primitive means like basic, what? They are, but that's not why. They could be arbitrarily complex functions. Primitive set. Uh, don't worry too much about what they've called it, but if you're wondering what the word primitive means, primitive means like basic. Like cavemen are primitive. I don't know. Is that, how else would you describe the word primitive? I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure here, because it's singly typed, 
are not typed. It's just, it's return, it's all numbers. I don't need to specify the return type. I'm pretty sure if this was a typed GP, I would need a different thing. I'd need to say GP dot something else. And one of the arguments would be, what is the return type of the root node, right? So if I was doing like the breast cancer classification where I was just having it return a Boolean, I would have to specify the root node is, has to return a Boolean. But the other things, the, all the other operators might return a Boolean and they might return a float or an, or an, an integer, right? But the root has to return a Boolean. Here, it doesn't matter. They're all numbers. I don't need to specify. It's fine. So I called it main. That's an arbitrary name. And then the second argument here, this is all in the documentation, of course. You go through the examples, you'll find all of this in there. The second argument is, how many arguments does the function take? And here it is the length of independent variables at index 0. I just took the top row of my independent variables and said, well, how many are in there? Two? All right, so this function takes two arguments. So this is just saying, OK, I need to make a function that's going to take two arguments. And then the allowable operators we have in there are add, subtract, multiply, protect and divide, uh, negate. And we'll talk about those for a second. Um, anyone want to take a wild guess what the second argument is? Nailed it. Exactly. Right? We, if we wrote our own special function called some ternary, tertiary operator, some function that takes three arguments and added it to the, to the primitive set there, I would have to have a three, right? Assuming it took three arguments. Um, by the way, when I say the function takes two arguments, I basically told the system, well, you now have two terminals the two potential parameter values, right? By the way, does anyone know the difference between an argument and a parameter? Uh-oh, it's such a basic thing and you don't know? The reason I'm teasing you is a lot of people will mix this up and it doesn't really matter, but there is a technical difference. The arguments are the values you give to a function. The parameters are the variable names inside the function. So you give arguments to a function, and then the function uses those arguments as parameters, right? Typically, people are mixing and matching those words. Everyone knows what they mean in terms of context, so it doesn't matter too much. But just as a, a neat little aside, there is a difference technically. Anyways. Um, so, so far, that first line says, it's a function that takes two arguments, meaning I've got two variables, right? x1 and x2. Two terminals that I can have in my trees, like x1, x2. OK? I've added all of these operators. A bunch of them are coming from Python's operator library. I just imported operator and said, OK, give me operator.add. I could have wrote my own addition function like I did with protect and divide, but whatever. And then finally at the end here, I'm saying also you can have some constant values. They're going to be integers between negative 10 and positive 10. And that's how I add it. This right here, this like, oh, partial, that means I'm saying it's a partial function for randint. And it's, these are going to start being the, the arguments. Kind of like you can like programmatically set default values for parameters for, it doesn't matter. This is the magic code that makes it work. It's a Python thing. Don't worry about anything overly Pythonic. Uh, Pythonic. All right, the first line, primitive set. Yeah, each operator is added to the primitive set. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ephemeral constants. Now, to be clear, that language I had there is not, in no way am I suggesting this is good. No, not at all. It's just, that's a language that you can start with. That's all. Deep setup, well, here's some just generic setup for deep. And if you're looking at this and going, oh my goodness, 
I say, well, that's why you read the docs. Because all of this is simple, actually, if you've read the docs. If you're trying to understand this by never seeing it before, you're, you're crazy. Obviously, you're not going to understand something you've never seen before. So just read the docs. I'll explain it, though. We start by saying, OK, I've got a problem. And it's a minimization problem. So I'm going to create this like fitness object called the fitness minimum. Uh, it's from this, the base is some like thing we import for deep. It's, it's going to be like the fitness function. And the weights, this is actually where you can actually do multi-objective optimization. You can add an arbitrary number of optim, like, um, right now I want to have I have a, a, an optimization problem where I'm optimizing a single value, the mean squared error. So I give it one weight, and the weight is negative one because it's a minimization problem. If it was a maximization problem, I would just have a positive one. But if I'm doing multi-objective and my fitness function was actually returning like two values, if I'm optimizing multiple things, you can have as many as you want, right? You just specify, well, I want minus one, minus one, positive one. So I've got three things two of which I want to minimize and the third I want to maximize. But don't worry too much about that right now. Not overly important. Then we are then saying, OK, <coughs> an individual, a chromosome, is going to be a primitive tree, meaning it's just it's going to be a tree. That's for GP, you use trees. So an individual is going to be made up of these trees, these S expressions. And the fitness for these things are going to be based on the, it's a minimization problem. If you're trying to understand exactly why it's done this way, you got to remember, this was made by some guy at Laval, and it works. Obviously, there was design behind it. If you're looking at this going like, hmm, maybe this could have been designed better. This is kind of like a weird way to write this. Yeah, maybe. It's fine. But you got to remember, this isn't like some like beefy package Google's provided to you, right? Like, you, this is just the way you do it. Just, I'm just making sure if you're like, it's kind of clunky how I have to set up this. OK, maybe, but that's fine. Then we create this toolbox. We say how we're going to generate the tree. Basically, how are we going to initialize our trees? This is saying, oh, with the gen half and half strategy, this is just a way to create your initial population. The primitive set that you're going to allow when generating the population is going to be the primitive set we created. Basically, based on the language, create trees based on this language. And the trees have to be between height 1 and 4 for creation. They could be bigger later. You can change those values. It doesn't matter. Uh, an individual, here's how you create the uh, iterate, creator, individual, box, generate, tree. OK, so then you like generate the individuals. Then you make the population by running that multiple times. And then here's how you're going to compile. This is just saying you can take, based on the primitive set, you can compile the chromosomes into something that's functional. Boilerplate code you need for deep. When I say boilerplate code, I just mean like deal with it, you need it. It's got to be there. Then I say to the toolbox, OK, how do we evaluate? Well, the evaluate function is going to be based on the mean squared error fitness. The toolbox is the toolbox. The independent variables are the independent variables. That's what we loaded in. And the dependent variable, the dependent variable. You'll actually notice that we actually haven't looked at mean squared error fitness. But these are actually setting what the arguments are. If we go up here, where's fitness? Now, this is actually, this is mean squared error, OK? This is mean squared error fitness. It's not the same function. Mean squared error fi fitness is just a wrapper function that calls mean squared error. But mean squared error fitness is a function that takes three arguments, the toolbox, independent variables, dependent variables. The toolbox is used to compile an actual tree into a function. And then that wrapper function passes that compiled tree, and it just passes on the independent and dependent variables that we specified on that initialization down there. We specify how we're going to do selection, just tournament selection. 
we specify what crossover we're going to do. We specify some tree. Why? I'm, I might be missing a line of code. I could be wrong. OK, no, never mind. We select how we're going to do crossover. We select how, and then this says how we're going to do mutation. But this right here says, OK, we're going to do a mutation, but how are we going to generate a new subtree with this gen full strategy? It doesn't matter too much. This is just setting up the, G the GP system with deep. That's all. It sets up the problem to be minimization, how the individuals will be encoded, how the individual population will be generated. It defines the evaluation metric, more on this below. It also sets the selection strategy and the genetic operators. Uh, ta -ta -ta. Note that the fitness functions must return a tuple because it could be multi-objective. If it's single objective, it returns a tuple of one value. Yeah, yeah. And here is the mean squared error fitness. Other than some uh, exception checking, it just compiles the individual, like I told you. It compiles the individual. It calls mean squared error with the callable function and just passes on the independent independent variables and then returns the final result. But again, note. It is a tuple. Even though it's a single value, it's a tuple of a single value. Cool? Cool. Any last questions? Okie dokie. There's really not much more to go over, but if you're itching to get the assignment one done, have at it. Assignment two, whatever. <laughs> Where am I? What year is this? All right, yeah. any, any questions or are we all good? All right, well done, all four of you here today. <laughs>